This is Dr. Leopson at the University of Arizona, and we're taking a look at Tier 3 intervention in school-wide positive behavioral interventions and supports. Um, we've talked a little about history, about function and what that means, but how do we determine function and how do, what kind of processes can we use to develop Tier 3 interventions? We're going to do a little little introduction to that now. We'll talk about the, the assessment, the identification of kids, the development of interventions, and how they're implemented and monitored. Because those are the important parts. We've got to find kids. We've got to do assessment. We've got to develop the intervention and we've got to implement that intervention and monitor it. Well, the first thing we have to do is find kids who need Tier 3 intervention services. Now, one way we can do that is with something like gated screening that uh, Hillwalker and Herb Severson implement in one of their assessment tools where first teachers rank all the kids on internalizing and externalizing characteristics. The three most internalizing and externalizing kids go on to gate, past gate one and go on to gate two where they are rated by teachers as to more specific characteristics on a standardized scale and those kids pass in gate 2 into gate 3 and their observations conducted. Um, this tool is really used more for research than it is for going out and finding kids. I don't think that's because it's a bad tool. I think it's expensive to implement and I think if you go looking for kids you find them. And those are two things that schools haven't been prepared to do, is consistently spend the money get, to get this done and to actually have services available for all the kids that they're going to find. Another way to find these kids that's less expensive is to wait for them to screw up. And that's a shame, but that's sort of how we find kids in positive behavioral interventions and supports. If we're using office referrals to find kids, like we might using the school-wide information system, and we're keeping track of the number of referrals per student, then after the first three months, we might want to take every child with more than 10 referrals and consider them for an individualized intervention. And that's kind of the way that schools using Swiss triage their kids for tier 3 intervention. The most traditional way to get kids into tier 3 intervention is through a teacher or parent referral. Okay. And that's still probably the most common way, but it's a great idea to try to use some screening tools, to reflect on data, because often referral takes the longest time, amount of time and and waits for the most failure before kids are referred for services. After identification, once we identify kids for tier 3 services, then we need to uh, assess their needs for services. Um, we use interviews with staff, parent, and never forget, we need to talk to kids. Sometimes they'll just tell you exactly what's wrong. Records reviews. Uh, there are tools that help us do reviews of records. They're great because uh, the records of kids who have many referrals and have lots of behavioral difficulties at school, their records are almost are often large and confusing and it's best to boil them down into something um, that allows us to look more easily for patterns. 
And then we do observations, and, and frankly, this is the most expensive part of conducting interventions um, because it takes people to take time to sit down in a classroom and watch and look for patterns of behavior. Patterns between the behavior, its antecedent, and the consequences. So what we're looking for here is, is there something consistent going on such that students are seated at the desk listening to instruction, Roger takes out his pen, the teacher asks Roger to put the pen away, is there something that happens repeatedly, right? They're still working. Roger takes out his pen, begins to write his name on his desk. Teacher takes the pen away. Students are working on math problems at their desk. Roger uses scissors to scratch his name on a chair. Roger gets a verbal warning. Verbal warning. The teacher takes the scissors away. Once we start to see a pattern, then we can. It will help us determine why it is that Roger writes on his desk, scratches his name in his desk, scratches his name in his chairs. Um, is he trying to access something? Teacher attention? Is he trying to avoid something? Is he trying to avoid somebody's attention, get somebody to leave him alone? Is he trying to access an activity? Is he trying to avoid some activity like his work? Is he trying, probably not trying to access or avoid any sensory input? But these observations are really critical. Right? Um, lots of folks try to do behavioral intervention just from interviews um, and record reviews, and it can be done, and it, it works. Um, but if you leave out observations, then you're leaving out one of the most critical pieces. Once you have those interviews, that review of records, that background data, observations, um, then we're ready to develop an intervention. This is the model of intervention development that uh, we've developed at the University of Arizona. Doctors Umbright, Farrow, myself, um, and along with Dr. Lang, who is currently at the uh, University of Kansas. And we teach a course in this. Um, I won't go into great detail in it now. But what we've determined is that there are really two important questions to consider when we develop interventions, and that is, can the student perform the replacement behavior, and do the antecedent conditions represent best practice? Because if the student cannot do the behavior, if they can't do the new thing you want them to do, if you want this child to raise his hand instead of scratching his name in his desk because he's looking for teacher attention, but he can't do that reliably. But the environment's set up for him to raise his hand. Everybody else does. Then all you have to do is teach him the new behavior. If this child can raise his hand reliably, if we've seen him do it, it's just that the environment's not set up right for him to do it. Nobody gets reinforced, nobody raises their hand in that class, then we need to fix the environment. If this child doesn't raise his hand reliably and the environment is screwed up, we gotta fix both. And if this child can raise his hand reliably and the, the environment's okay, then we've gotta adjust the contingency. Then something else is going on. Then we need to put together an intervention plan. Again, we do te we teach a course in this. Um, some of you have probably taken it. And all of our interventions include attention to the antecedent conditions, to reinforcing the new behavior, and making sure that when the old behavior shows up, it no longer works that it doesn't function the way it did before. We want the new behavior to function. We want the old behavior to not be able to function in that environment. And then we turn it into a behavior intervention plan. 
Now, one of the other thing, important things to consider is that there are multiple models for intervention. Um, there is an expert model, which means that someone comes to you, um, does the interviews, the records reviews, the observations, and hands you a plan, and you implement the plan. There is a consultation model in which someone, an expert, comes and helps and sits with you and does the interviews, the observations, you help with the record search, and then you sit together and you talk about what would work in your environment. If you're going to fix the environment, what fixes will work in your environment? Okay. If you are supposed to reinforce this kid, what kind of reinforcement is going to work best? There are also team-developed interventions where a whole group will sit down and come up with an intervention for a student. Um, there's not, there's conflicting data about which intervention works best, all right, which model for developing an intervention works best. Um, but you should be aware of what kind of intervention model is being implemented. Um, we're taking a look now, or beginning to take a look, at whether or not consultation models in this mode will get you a better intervention, simply because um, they work better with the teacher and in the environment. Finally, there's implementing and monitoring the intervention once you come up with it. Um, we've got to collect data, and there are multiple ways to collect data. I know this data collection sheet looks really confusing, um, but if you've taken some of our courses like uh, 402 or 502, you probably look at it and recognize it immediately. We need to summarize that data regularly. Okay? A graphic summary is the best way. So here immediately you can tell that we've tried out the intervention. This was baseline, implement the intervention, baseline, implement the intervention. Looks like the intervention leads to better, higher levels of the behavior, percent of intervals of cooperative behavior, than not having the intervention in place. And so we implement it, and we end up with high levels. It's easy to read a graph like this. And so graphic data is a great way to go. See, we also have treatment integrity listed here. That means the degree to which the intervention is actually implemented, and that's critical to monitor also. Oh, I should say um, that we teach the development of single subject research designs in a course SERP 590. It's a fully online course at the University of Arizona um, and we're getting a lot of students coming out with that with some great research that they're conducting at the end of the course. Finally we've got to attend to the ethics and social validity. So to what degree is the intervention observed to be ethical? And we monitor that as we're developing it and we monitor it afterwards. Same thing with social validity. We look at it ahead of time to determine what is it that's going to lead for the individual and the community around the individuals to believe that the intervention was really was successful and was socially valid and, and was actually called for in the long run. That's a really quick look at the process for developing function-based interventions in Tier 3 school-wide positive behavioral interventions and supports.